I'm Austin Lugo, and this is The Vignette. Welcome back, one and all, to another episode of The Vignette. Today we're going to be reading The Man of the House by Frank O'Connor. I want to apologize in advance for my voice. I've had this pretty terrible cold the last couple of days. I hope I don't pass it to any of you, but this is the first day I've had a voice at all, let alone a voice of any real significance. So this isn't going to be my best quality stuff, but as they say, the show must go on and this is for you. So this is The Man of the House by Frank O'Connor. When I woke, I heard my mother coughing below in the kitchen. She had been coughing for days, but I had paid no attention. We were living on the old Yodel Road at the time, the old hilly coaching road into East Cork. The coughing sounded terrible. I dressed and went downstairs in my stocking feet, and in the clear morning light I saw her, unaware that she was being watched, collapsed into a little wicker work chair, holding her side. She had made an attempt to light the fire, but it had gone against her. She looked so tired and helpless that my heart turned over with compassion. I ran to her. Are you all right, Mom? I asked. I'll be all right in a second, she replied, trying to smile. The old sticks were wet and the smoke started me coughing. Go back to bed and I'll light the fire, I said. Ah, how can I, child, she said anxiously. Sure, I have to go to work. You couldn't work like that, I said. I'll stop at home from school and look after you. It's a funny thing about women, the way they'll take orders from anything in trousers, even if it's only 10. If you can make yourself a cup of tea, I might be all right later on, she said guiltily, and she rose, very shakily, and calling back up the stairs. I knew then she must be feeling really bad. I got more sticks out of the coal hole under the stairs. My mother was so economical that she never used enough, and that was why the fire sometimes went against her. I used a whole bundle, and I soon had the fire roaring in the kettle on made her toast while I was about it. I was a great believer in hot buttered toast at all hours of the day. Then I made the tea and brought her up a cup on the tray. Is that all right, I asked. Do you have a sup of boiling water left, she asked doubtfully. Tis too strong, I agreed cheerfully, remembering the patience of the saints and their many afflictions. I'll pour half of it out. I am an old nuisance, she sighed. Tis my fault, I said, taking the cup. I can never remember about tea. Put the shawl around you while you're sitting up. Will I shut the skylight? Would you be able? She asked doubtfully. Tis no trouble, I said, getting the chair to it. I'll do the message after. I had moaned breakfast alone by the window, and then I went out and stood by the door to watch the kids from the road on the way to school. You'd better hurry or you'll be killed, Sullivan, they shouted. I'm not going, I said. My mother is sick, and I have to mind the house. I wasn't a malicious child by any means but I like to be able to take out my comforts and study them by the light of others' misfortunes. Then I heated another kettle of water and cleared up the breakfast things before I washed my face and came up to the attic with my shopping basket, a piece of paper, and a lead pencil. I'll do the messages now if you'll write them down, I said. Would you like me to get the doctor? Ah, said my mother impatiently. He'd only want to send me to the hospital. And how would I go to the hospital? You could call in the chemist and ask him to give you a good, strong cough bottle. Write down, I said. If I have it written down, I might forget it. And put strong, big letters. What will I get for the dinner? Eggs? My spoiled eggs were the only dish I could manage. I more or less knew it would be eggs. But she told me to get sausages as well, in case she could get up. I passed the school on my way. Opposite it was a hill, and I went up a short distance and stood there for ten minutes in quiet contemplation. The schoolhouse and yard and gate were revealed as in painted picture, detached and peaceful, except for the chorus of voices through the open windows and the glimpses of Danny Delaney, the teacher, passing the front door with his cane behind his back, stealing a glance at the world outside. I could have stood there all day. Of all the profound and simple pleasures of those days, that was the richest. When I got home, I rushed upstairs and found Minnie Ryan sitting with my mother. She was a middle-aged woman, very knowledgeable, gossipy, and pious. How are you, Mum? I asked. Grand, said my mother with a smile. You can't get up today, though, said Minnie Ryan. I'll put the kettle on and make a cup of tea for you, I said. Sure, I'll do that, said Minnie. Ah, uh, don't worry, Miss Ryan, I said lightly. I can manage all right. 
Wisha, isn't he very good? I heard her say in a low voice to my mother. As good as gold, said my mother. There's not many like that, then, said many. The most of them that's going now are most like savages than Christians. In the afternoon, my mother wanted me to run out and play, but I didn't go far. I knew if once I went a certain distance from the house, I was liable to stray into temptation. Below our house, there was a glen, the drill field of the barracks perched high above it on a chalky cliff, and below, in a deep hollow, the mill pond and mill stream running between wooden hills. The Rockies, the Himalayas, or the highlands, according to your mood. Once down there, I tended to forget the real word. So I sat on the wall outside the house, running in every half hour to see how the mother was and if there was anything she wanted. Evening fell, the street lamps were lit, and the paper boy went crying up the road. I bought a paper, lit the lamp in the kitchen and the candle in my mother's attic, and tried to read to her. Not very successfully, because I was only at words of one syllable, but I had a great wish to please, and she to be pleased. So we got on quite well, considering. Later, Minnie Ryan came again, and as she was going, I saw her to the door. If she's not better in the morning, I think I'd get the doctor a flurry, she said over her shoulder. Why? I asked the alarm. Do you think she's worse, Miss Ryan? Uh, I wouldn't say so, she replied with affected nonchalance. But I'd be frightened she might get pneumonia. But wouldn't he send her to the hospital, Miss Ryan? Wisha, he mightn't, she said to you with a shrug, pulling her old shawl about her. But even if he did, wouldn't it be better than neglecting it? He wouldn't have a drop of whiskey in the house. I'll get it, I said at once. I knew what might happen to people who got pneumonia and what was bound to happen afterward to their children. If you could give it to her hot with a squeeze of lemon, it might help her shake it off, said Minnie. My mother said she didn't want the whiskey, dreading the expense, but I had got such a fright that I wouldn't be put off. When I went to the public house, it was full of men who drew aside to let me reach the bar. I had never been in the public house before, and I was frightened. Hello, my old flower, said one man, grinning diabolically at me. It must be ten years since I seen you last. What are you having? My pal, Bob Cannell, had told me how he once asked a drunk man for a crown, and the man gave it to him. I always wish I could bring myself to the same, but I didn't feel like it just then. I want a half glass of whiskey for my mother, I said. Oh, the thundering ruffian, said the man, pretending tis for his mother. And the last time I seen him, he had to be carried home. I had not, shouted indignantly. And tis for my mother. She's sick. Ah, let the child alone, Johnny, said the barmaid. She gave me the whiskey and then, still frightened of men in the public house, I went off to a shop for a lemon. When my mother had drunk the hot whiskey, she fell asleep, and I quenched the lights and went to bed, but I couldn't sleep very well. I was regretting I hadn't asked the man in the pub for a half crown. I was weakened several times by the coughing. When I went into my mother's room, her health felt very hot, and she was rambling in her talk. It frightened me more than anything else when she didn't know me, and I lay awake thinking of what would happen to me if it was really pneumonia. The depression was terrible when, next morning, my mother seemed not to be any better. I had done all I could, and I felt helpless. I lit the fire and got her breakfast, but this time I didn't stand at the front door to see the other fellows on their way to school. I should have been too inclined to envy them. Instead, I went over to Minnie Ryan and reported. I'd go for the doctor, she said firmly. Better be sure than sorry. I had first to go to the house of a poor law guardian for a ticket to show we couldn't pay. Then I went down to the dispensary, which was in a deep hollow beyond the school. After that, I had to go back to ready the house for the doctor. I'd have a basin of water and soap and a clean towel laid out for him. I'd have to get the dinner, too. It was after dinner when he called. He was a fat, loud-voiced man and like all the drunks of the medical profession, supposed to be the cleverest doctor in Cork, if only he'd mind himself. He hadn't been minding himself much that morning, it seemed. How are you going to get this now, he grumbled, sitting on the bed with the prescription pad on his knee. The only place open is the North Dispensary. I'll go, doctor, I said at once, relieved that he had said nothing about hospital. Tis a long way, he said doubtfully. Do you know where it is? I'll find it, I said. Isn't he a great little fellow, he said to my mother. Oh, the best in the world, doctor, she said. A daughter couldn't be better to me. That's right, said the doctor. Look after your mother. She'll be the best for you in the long run. We don't mind them when we have them, he added to my mother. And then we spend the rest of our lives regretting her. I wish she hadn't said that. It tuned it all together too well with my mood. To make it worse, he didn't even use the soap and water I had laid ready for him. My mother gave me directions how to reach the dispensary, and I set off with a bottle wrapped in a brown paper under my arm. 
The road led uphill through a thickly populated poor locality as far as the barracks, which was perched on the very top of the hill over the city, and then descended between high walls till it suddenly almost disappeared in a stony path with red brick corporation houses to one side of it that dropped steeply, steeply to the valley of the little river where a brewery stood and the opposite hillside, a murmuring honeycomb of houses, rose to the gently rounded top on which stood the purple sandstone tower of the cathedral and the limestone spire of Shandon Church on a level with your eye. It was so wide a view that it was never all lit up together. And the sunlight wandered across it as across a prairie, picking out first a line of roofs with a brightness like snow, and then delving into the depths of some dark street and outlining in shadow figures of climbing carts and straining horses. I leaned on the low wall and thought how happy a fellow could be looking at that if he had nothing to trouble him. I tore myself from it with a sigh, slithered without stooping to the bottom of the hill, and climbed up a series of shadowy and stepped lanes around the back of the cathedral, which now seemed enormous. I had a penny, which my mother had given me by way of encouragement, and I made up my mind that when I had done my business, I should go into the cathedral and spend it on a candle to the Blessed Virgin to make my mother better quit. I felt sure it would be more effective in a really big church like that, so very close to heaven. The dispensary was a sordid little hallway with a bench to one side and a window like the one in a railway ticket office at the far end. There was a little girl with a green plaid shawl about her shoulder sitting on the bench. I knocked at the window and a seedy, angry-looking man opened it. Without waiting for me to finish what I was saying, he grabbed the bottle and prescription from me and banged the shutter down again without a word. I waited for a moment and then lifted my hand to knock again. You'll have to wait, little boy, said the girl quickly. What will I have to wait for, I asked. You have to make it up, she explained. You might as well sit down. I did, glad of anyone to keep me company. Where are you from, she asked. I live in Blarney Lane, she added when I had told her. Who's the bottle for? My mother, I said. What's wrong with her? She have a bad cough. She might have consumption, she said thoughtfully. That's what my sister that died last year had. This is a tonic for my older sister. She have to have tonics all the time. It is nice where you live. I told her about the Glen, and then she told me about the river near their place. It seemed to be a nicer place than ours, as she described it. She was a pleasant, talkative little girl, and I didn't notice the time until the window opened again and a red bottle was thrust out. Dooley, she had the seedy man and closed the window again. That's me, said the little girl. Yours won't be ready for a good while yet. I'll wait for you. I have a penny, said boastfully. She waited until my bottle was thrust out, and then she accompanied me as far as the steps leading down to the brewery. On the way, I bought a penny worth of sweets, and we sat on the other steps beside the infirmary to eat them. It was nice there. With the spire of Shandon and shadows behind us, the young trees overhanging the high walls, and the sun, when it came out, and the great golden blasts throwing over link shadows onto the road. Give us a taste of your bottle, little boy, she said. Why, I asked, can't you taste your own? Mine is awful, she said. Tonics is awful to taste. You can try it if you like. I took a taste of it and hastily spat it out. She was right. It was awful. After that, I couldn't do less than let her test mine. That's grand, she said enthusiastically after taking a swig from it. Cough bottles are nearly always grand. Try it, can't you? I did, and saw she was right about that, too. It was very sweet and sticky. Give us another, she said excitedly, grabbing at it. Twill be all gone, I said. Er, it won't, she replied with a laugh. You have gallons of it. Somehow, I couldn't refuse her. I was swept from my anchorage into an unfamiliar world of spires and towers, trees, steps, shadowy laneways, and little girls with red hair and green eyes. I took a drink myself and gave her another. Then I began to panic. Tis nearly gone, I said. What am I going to do now? Finish it and say the cork fell out, she replied. And again, as she said it, it sounded plausible enough. We finished the bottle between us, and then, slowly, as I looked at it in my hand, empty as I had brought it, I remembered that I had not kept my word to the Blessed Virgin and had spent her penny on sweets. A terrible despondency swept over me. I had sacrificed everything for the little girl, and she didn't even care for me. It was my cough bottle she had coveted all the time. I saw her guilt too late. I put my head in my hands and began to cry. What are you crying for? The little girl asked in astonishment. My mother is sick and we're drinking half of her medicine, I said. Ah, don't be an old crybaby, she said contemptuously. You've only to say the cork fell out. Sure, that's a thing. Could happen to anybody. And I promised the Blessed Virgin a candle and I spent the money on you, I screamed. And suddenly, grabbing the empty bottle, I ran up the road from her wailing. Now I had only one refuge and one hope, a miracle. I went back to the cathedral and, 
Kneeling before the shrine of the Blessed Virgin, I begged her pardon for having spent her penny and promised her a candle from the next penny I got. If only she would work a miracle and make my mother better before I got back. After that, I crawled miserably homeward, back up the great hill, but now all the light had gone out of the day, and the murmuring hillside had become a vast, alien, cruel world. Besides, I felt very sick. I thought I might be going to die. In one way, it would be better. When I got back into the house, the silence of the kitchen, and then the sights of the fire gone out, and the grate smote me with the cruel realization that the Blessed Virgin had let me down. There was no miracle, and my mother was still in bed. At once I began to howl. What is it at all, child? She called an alarm from upstairs. I lost the medicine, I bellowed, and rushed up the stairs to throw myself on the bed and bury my face in the clothes. Oh, Wisha, if that's all, that's a trouble to you, she exclaimed with relief, running her hand through my hair. Is anything the matter? She added after a moment. You're very hot. I drank the medicine, I bawled. Ah, oh, what harm, she murmured soothingly. You poor, unfortunate child. Twas my own fault for letting you go all that way by yourself, and then to have your journey for nothing. Undress yourself now, and you can lie down here. She got up, put on her slippers and coat, and unlaced my boots while I sat on the bed. But even before she had finished, I was fast asleep. I didn't see her dress herself or hear her go out. But sometime later, I felt a hand on my forehead and saw Minnie Ryan peering down at me laughing. Ah, it will be nothing, she said, giving her shawl a pole about her. I'll sleep it off by morning. The dear knows, Mrs. Sullivan, that you should be in bed. I knew that was a judgment on me, but I could do nothing about it. Later, I saw my mother come in with a candle and her paper, and I smiled up at her. She smiled back. Minnie Ryan might despise me as much as that she liked, but there were others who didn't. A miracle had happened after all.